I will take the ring to Moldor. Welcome to AMV Books and Films. My name is April and today we're going to be talking about The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. R. Tolkien. And today I have special guests with me, dear friends of mine, Jerry Barraza and Claudia Barraza. Hi. Hi. <laughs> All right, so I consider them experts on this and so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> All right, so I guess the first thing that we should probably mention is how we know each other. Um, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. and uh, I forget what year it was when we first met. Um, I want to say it was almost closer to our wedding, right? Right, it was around 2009. 2009, okay, yes. so uh, when my son was a baby. Um, yeah, yeah. So my husband first served together with Jerry, and then once he married Claudia, um, that's how I got to know her, then we started serving together and we became fast friends, and so we were lucky enough and blessed enough to go to their Lord of the Rings inspired uh, wedding. I remember that day very, very well. I brought my two, two one and a half year old son to that wedding, and I remember walking around holding his hand just kind of looking at the the beautiful uh, centerpieces and the banners that were hanging around. And yes. uh, my husband, Elias, there, of course, was there. And he was also explaining the different imagery that we see throughout the films. It was all throughout your yes. wedding. So, um, And I always kind of knew that you guys were uh, fans of Lord of the Rings. Um, Elias would always tell me, like, yes, uh, Jerry is a big fan of Lord of the Rings. And then, but I didn't know until I went yes. to your guys' wedding. I'm like, oh, like, yes, they are. Yes. They are fans, yeah. We are. These are serious fans of Lord of the Rings. So anyway, so I wanted to get started with uh, what attracted you to Lord of the Rings? Okay, well, for myself, when I was younger, I was in high school. I was in my literature uh, class. And I had this awesome uh, teacher, Mr. Manners. And um, we went over different uh, stories, different books, and I remember he mentioned the Lord of the Rings, and he just gave us like a brief uh, story about what it was about. We didn't jump right into it because it wasn't part of the curriculum for the year, so it's not like we read it. But I really like that style of uh, of stories, the I, fantasy I, style. Yes, and the medieval. Uh, yeah. stuff uh, ever since I was little so I that one kind of like got stuck on my head I was like oh that's something I would like to like probably read later although I never read it uh, once the movie started coming out uh, it was the first thing I when I saw the poster I was like I need to watch that that yes. movie and I, I didn't watch it at the theaters but I went as soon as the movie came out on on a VHS tape I bought it and I watched it and then I liked it, and then I was able to see the second and the third movie on the theaters, and I took my mom to, to watch it, and I, I just fell in love with them. Yeah, Peter Jackson's films are just incredible, deep, deep. And Jerry? Yeah, well, uh, similar to Claudia, um, I grew up in El Salvador, so in El Salvador there's not really a, a, a big movement to promote um, European authors, right? So when Tolkien was mentioned, and I, I believe I was in high school, he was mentioned in passing, like really quick. This is Tolkien. He wrote The Lord of the Rings. Move on to the next. Um, and the same as Claudia. I saw the posters once, and I've, I've always been attracted to medieval to the medieval things. When I was a little boy, I mean, I I had uh, little knights. I had castle models. Um, I mean, you name it. My my whole thing was about playing playing with knights, playing with castles. You still do that? Um, I still do that. Yeah, at a bigger scale um, and when the movie came out I, I felt drawn to it just by looking at the poster uh, just uh, I remember Elijah Wood poster holding the one ring and you have that blackness behind him and it just seemed I don't know it attracted me it, there, there was something about the poster itself that that, that caught my that caught my eye um, so 
I remember I didn't I didn't get to see it in theaters the very first movie. I actually the same. I bought it on VHS. Um, I went to Walmart. I, I got it, and then I played it. And I remember after I watched it, I was like, "What did I just see?" Um, it was it was an impressive movie, and I just kept playing it over and over and over because I wanted to understand what was happening. And a lot of people complain that the movie, the first movie, is slow. I didn't find it slow. In fact, it is my favorite film of the three. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kept playing it over and over and over again. Uh, I fell in love with the music. I think the music was one of the main things that was just Beautiful. standing out from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, I went to theaters to watch the second film. So it was around that time when, um, when I when I found out there were actual books, and it was a really lengthy book, and I wanted to read it. Um, so all the movies came about. My parents actually gave me. Um, I don't know if you can see it back there. My very first copy of the Lord of the Rings for Christmas. Yeah, let's bring it out to the forefront. Let's show the the people just this beautiful edition. So this is my my very first edition. I remember I, I scribbled down. I don't do that on books anymore, but I used to. Nice. As my name, it says uh, December twenty fifth, two thousand and five. That's when my, my parents gave me this and paired with the Hobbit. And I read the Hobbit, and I remember reading the Hobbit for the very first time. Um, while playing Enya in the background and that just I, I still remember those days I mean it was like a magical time for me it opened the door I realized um, I learned about all the stories that were out there I, I started going to like Barnes and Nobles and Borders and I found more books on Tolkien and I would just go there and sit at Barnes and Nobles and I would buy myself something to drink and just sit there while listening to music and read this wonderful stories and from there it's just um, yeah, it's just this one thing after another. Mm. Watching Would you call movies. it an obsession, Claudia? <laughs> it's a healthy obsession. Actually, he he got me into <laughs> reading. Uh, I like to read, but not not as much as he as he does. I'm more like a visual type of person. Although I do like a lot of fantasy and, and mythology. Like those are like my genre that I like to to read. Mm. So he actually got me to actually sit down and read the book, you know, The Hobbit, The Silmarillion, and I love them. I, I really like them, but like he he goes really into depth on, on those books. Yeah. More than me for sure. That's a hyper fixation, yes. I guess. <laughs> so I guess what I wanted to ask you guys, one of the first questions is what is Lord of the Rings and how did it spawn in Tolkien's mind? Yes, that is a very good question. Um, as as you know Tolkien was, he was a philologist. He really loved languages. Since he was a child, he started developing languages, yes. um, codes with his brother, um, Hillary. He, he came up with all these different languages throughout his childhood. And one of the things that kind of stuck with him is the creation of the Elvish languages that we know nowadays, um, the Quenya and the Sindarin. Um, when he developed the languages, he started wondering what kind of people would speak those languages. And then after that, where will those people live? and what kind of stories would they, those people tell and that's basically the essence of how this whole middle earth and arda thing we have we have now uh, in books and it's thanks to that because the story how he developed them he wasn't like a normal writer like he would write the story of a character and then he would start developing that character into the world that he's in he started in in, in a way or in a sense backwards he started from the larger scale into the smaller scale and that's why when you read the Lord of the Rings, or you read the Hobbit, or even you read the Silmarillion, which is um, a more, a, a broader book, yeah. it feels like history. It feels like it's part of a real place because there's so much depth into it, uh, so much thought and so much care and love that he put into those stories that, I mean, it's just amazing. The more you read them, the more it feels, it almost feels like it's part of our history, which was yes. Tolkien's intent. That from was purpose. Yeah, yes, that was the purpose. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think I, we can consider Tolkien as one of the greatest fantasy writers of the modern era. He's just, his worlds are so deep, the lore, the history, so the locations as well. It, it's just so deep and so layered and so rich that you're right. It feels like history. It feels like our history. So I think that's part of or one of the reasons why we can connect so well with Tolkien. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the summary. We're going to hit major plot points and then discuss the themes that we see inside. Um, 
But before we do, we need to explain that there will be spoilers up ahead. So if you have not read the book, now is probably a good time to shut off the video, read the book, and then come back to the video so that you guys can comment any of your opinions um, down below. So uh, we begin in the Shire. Um, the Shire is an idyllic place, a place of safety, a place of peace. This is where we meet Bilbo Baggins, who is going to be celebrating his 111th birthday and it's going to be a big celebration we also see Gandalf come into town um, he's followed in his cart by a bunch of little children running after him and it's just a lovely scene it was one of my favorite parts of the book where the little children are following him and they're just laughing and having a good time and teasing him and Gandalf's kind of teasing them and it just kind of shows and it kind of paints the picture of an idyllic place a place of uh, goodness a place of wholesome uh, of families together and so it also sets the stage for Frodo, Bilbo's cousin mm -hmm. and um, he is also met with Gandalf and this is where he starts learning of uh, Bilbo's ring but we can go further into the story now so we see the hobbits and they're very simple simple creatures, simple people mm -hmm. and um, they're very lovely and um, they're very family oriented but why do you think Tolkien chooses to uncover Middle Earth through the eyes of hobbits rather than, you know, the eyes of men? Later we see that there's Boromir and Aragorn. Why, why hobbits? Why start to look at Middle Earth through the eyes of hobbits? In my opinion, I think the, the reason why he started with the hobbits is because they're, that's what they are. They're very simple. And um, into that world, the uh, Middle Earth, um, people they're like very insignificant actually in, in the books like hardly anybody know of their existence because they keep to themselves they're like you know this separate place on their own little world on their own of their own so many of the, the of the men and creatures of the of the earth they don't really know about hobbits they even think they're just from the mythology until they actually see one of them so maybe because of that, because they're very simple, uh, I guess Tolkien wanted to give that impression that even if you're the smallest, simple creature, you can make a big difference in this big world. So I, I believe that's that's what he tried. Instead of, you know, just using a, a man or even an elf, you know, they're great. They, they can achieve so many things. Mm -hmm. But he chose the simple one, the humble one. Exactly. To to start there and use their I use their sort through them to see how the the world changes by their choices, by their options. Yeah, it reminds me of the scriptures: by small and simple things, great things are brought to pass. And All right. that is a connection, you know, that we can make and, here in Tolkien. And I think that's one of the things that he's trying to encourage on us that we can make a difference. We might even might ourselves might feel that we might not make a difference, but we are here for with a purpose, and uh, that's why Eru plays the hobbits, you know, because yes. of that nice singleness, you know, simple creatures, loving creatures they they were, and how they make that big difference, and, and in at the end save the whole Middle Earth. Yes. Yes, I I agree. I mean the. The hobbits are such special creatures, and we see them with this, with this, um, these eyes. I mean, through loving eyes, I guess, because they're they're small creatures. Very, they're very simple. Uh, they're very good natured. They're not by all means innocent. I mean, they have their own things right. among mm -hmm. them, right. but it's not by comparison with the rest of the world. It's not. It's not as bad. Um, they are from the, the from the family of men, so they're also men. Um, they're not a different race. They're not a. They're not separate. They're not like dwarves, or they're not like elves. They are also men. They're just a separate like, branch of of men, and they are different from men in 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 the aspect that they don't actually, they don't. They're not seeking power. Yeah. They, they don't want glory. They don't want um, to hold power for themselves. They only only want to be left alone in peace enjoying their gardens, enjoying their books, enjoying their armchairs. I mean, that's what <laughs> yeah. they do. That's what they like to do. And and mm -hmm. another thing is that when Tolkien wrote this story, um, it was a story about The Hobbit. The, yes. the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. is a sequel to The Hobbit. But if you read other stories, like if you read The Silmarillion, um, if you read uh, the Baron Luthien stories, The Children of Hurin, the story is told through the eyes of elves, through the eyes of men. Um, 
So we see more of those stories in other books, but in this particular story, the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit is just specifically through the eyes of Hobbits because the, the story was intended for children. Children are the ones who are reading the stories and they are the ones who feel small and insignificant and they don't want power. Um, so that when they're reading the stories, they feel, they're feeling all this inspiration that comes to them because they, can, they know that they can achieve something great. Um, eventually they can. I agree. I, I think just the whole notion of that safety of the Shire and uh, the sense of peace, um, an idyllic place, but we all know that Frodo must leave the Shire just as Bilbo has. And, um, and one of the themes that we found in the book was that uh, Frodo must leave to answer the call of responsibility. And what that means is that he must leave the safety of the Shire in order to go out and have an adventure and to sort of go out and to get into a little bit of danger because without struggle there is no growth. And I do have to mention here, this kind of harkens back throughout all Western literature that um, it kind of follows the sort of prototype that is laid out in the Old Testament. So if you guys remember Abraham, he is called out of his place of safety, his father's house, and he has to go out into the wilderness and it's not easy for him like immediately he comes upon you know treachery and horrible dealings of others and he's a stranger in a strange land and he's treated as such and um but he goes out because there is something for him to do there is a call of responsibility for him and we also see that if you guys were following along in benjamin mcavoy's book club 2023 we just read the brothers karamazov and if you guys remember the uh, idyllic sort of peaceful character of Alyosha. He is also very sort of naive. Uh, he's um, attached to the monastery where he is living at and he must also go out. He, his father Zosima asks him to go out into the world and to experience life and to love people up close. And so this kind of harkens back and it's sort of a sort of a motif that we see a lot in Western literature and we can see that here also in Tolkien's world. And so when Gandalf tells Frodo of the ring and he tells him the story of the ring and he tells him the burden that he must bear and Frodo, he feels the weight of this burden and he says, and he says that, you know, I wish that this had not come to me um, at this time. And Gandalf basically says, um, well, he says, and, and so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that it's given us, uh, which is such a powerful quote. I yeah, mean, um, one of the best. Sometimes we feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we feel we're in a position where we're having trials, tribulations, and we yeah. we think, why is this happening to me? Uh, why is, you know, it's mm -hmm. happening to me now? Mm -hmm. And what we have to decide, what, how we're gonna be handling our situation. We don't get to choose what situations come to us but we have to, we can choose how we're going to react to those situations. Yeah, absolutely. And even further on in this uh, particular chapter, you know, once Frodo is set on going about on this journey, he asks Gandalf, you know, where do I go? And I think Gandalf says something to the effect of, you need to go towards danger. Um, I couldn't find the quote, but um, and that's just, what Tolkien is basically saying is that we can't just have second breakfast all the time or that we can't just keep smoking our pipe weed all day <laughs> mm -hmm. that we have to go out and um struggle a little bit to learn to grow and to bring some sort of knowledge back to um to us and also to sort of um defend what we love the shire and that's mm -hmm. what is that's what frodo loves is the shire yeah, no, and, and I remember it kind of came to my mind when uh, that's, you know, one of the persons why we're here, too. We're not, like, we didn't stay back in our, you know, with our Heavenly Father. You know, right. we have to come here, you know, to leave that comfort zone so we can actually grow. Right. So that's why we are here at the moment mm -hmm. in our own adventure. Yes. Yes. Each of us has our own adventure. Um, and of course, you know, this whole book is centered on the major theme of good versus evil and that the power corrupts. So absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is a, a, a quote from The Prince. Mm -hmm. But we see that throughout this whole novel and throughout many other famous novels in Western literature. But here um, we see that in the form of this ring that um, does to people. And we see that um, when... Gandalf has the ring, 
he doesn't really hold it, but or he doesn't really put it on or anything. But he, uh, Frodo asks Gandalf to take it from him, and Gandalf says no. He's very wary of wielding the power of the ring, and um, it just goes to show that he, uh, being a very powerful and wise and good benevolent person or a being, um, he is also very aware that there are dark sides to all of us. That um, if he were to have that ring, then who knows what would come about. Mm-hmm. And um, we also get the story of Gollum, or Smeagol, right? Um, and then we kind of see a little bit of a dark side to Frodo, too. And the part where Gandalf tells Frodo the story of Smeagol, and Frodo thinks that he deserves death. And yes. then Gandalf says, no, no, no. <clears throat> like, you know, you have to be very careful of that yeah. kind of thinking. And um, we do see that in Frodo a little bit, a little bit of a dark side, and Gandalf kind of reprimands Frodo in that moment. Yeah, yes. um, so yeah, because he does say that, that it was Beowulf's um, that led him kind. You know, he did kindness to yeah to Smeagol to Gollum, and he's like, like you who make you judge, right? Yeah, to, to judge his to judge him. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, and and you see. Gandalf tells us in the story that in his heart there's more to play there's mm-hmm. there's all these pieces who are just left there or seem to be left um, untethered to to anything they have a part to play and you get to see that towards the end of the book and one of the the themes that's kind of reoccurring in the book is the theme of divine intervention um, Very good. it is not like explicitly stated that Eru is the one moving pieces around, but you can feel it in the story. You can feel when things happen by chance. Nothing happens by chance. Um, the universe is rarely so so lazy, Sherlock says. Right. Um, so you have you have a divine being moving all these parts to to, to kind of get accomplishment or or accomplish the task that has been given to them, and you know, the fact that Gollum is left alive by Bilbo, by Bilbo showing mercy, he's actually helping uh, to achieve the ultimate goal, which is to destroy the One Ring, because Frodo is, gets corrupted at the end. I mean, yes, he loses that battle. Yes. And he takes the ring for himself. That's true. Yeah, you're right. I totally forgot about that part, because Gandalf does say, I feel that he does have a part to play, play in yeah. this story, and how this mm-hmm. ring, the, the story ends. Okay, excellent. And of course, we have the, the theme of friendship, which is it would permeates the entire book. Mm-hmm. Um, friendship and friendship among strangers, which is which is really great. Um, but in this situation, in the very beginning of the novel, is Frodo. We see Frodo, his friendship with Gandalf, Gandalf's friendship with Bilbo. And even if you haven't had read The Hobbit, it's very palpable, the friendship that they have. Uh, you really feel that they are really good friends and that they really trust each other, Bilbo and Gandalf. And then later on, um, we see Gandalf also be a friend to Frodo when he says, you know, this is, I shall bear this burden with you. And this is um, just a a powerful moment, a very touching moment. And you see those types of moments throughout the entire, the entire story. And Merry and Pippin and Sam also, um, they exhibit uh, their friendships with Frodo as well. But do they really feel the heavy burden of what Frodo feels now? Or do you feel that they kind of learn that along the way? Or they, they know that this is something that they have mm-hmm. to do too? I think that they didn't really realize or have that grasp yet. Um, they did have knowledge about the, the ring. and But I don't think they knew what actually what ring was that. That it actually belonged to the Dark Lord. Right. So I think they they stick with Proto out of uh, friendship because they're like um, the Shar is like at this huge family, um, so they grew together and they like support each other. But I don't think they knew, at least not Pepin, Pepin and Mary. Uh, we know that Sam had a little more knowledge because he's kinda like eavesdropping. Yes, <laughs> correct. And, and obviously, you know, kind of like he grasped a little bit of the seriousness on mm-hmm. why they had to leave the Shire. Yeah. But I don't think that Pippin and Mary did. Although they were a little more adventurous than than Sam. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yes. There's yeah, the that theme of friendship it's it's very palpable like you said throughout mm-hmm. the entire story. Uh 
they are with Frodo f for a sense of, of loyalty, for a sense of friendship. Yes, yes. Um, they love each other yes. and they're unwilling to part with each other. They basically say, you know, we know that you want, you're planning to leave and we're coming with you. With whether you like it or not. And one of the unsung <laughs> heroes in the story is Fatty Bulger. I mean, <laughs> Fatty true. Bulger is not mentioned um, in the movies. <laughs> in the movies, in the movies yeah, um, they cut get, him out. He doesn't get much love. Fatty Bulger alone, <laughs> he he dresses as Frodo. He stays behind to detract the ring rates. I mean, when the ring rates oh. show up at his house and they start knocking mm -hmm. on the doors, like, open up in the name of Mordor. He's the one who riles up everybody and then, right. like pushes the entire mass of people against the ring breaks. Such bravery. So, I mean, clap yes. to Fatty Bulger. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that he was cut out from, from a movie. But, yes, but this, that sense of friendship. I mean, they're so united. They're so willing to help each other out. And mainly, they, right. and they don't, I don't think they fully understand, like, like Claudia said, they don't fully understand the gravity of the situation. They have a sense of, of urgency, but they Something's don't, going on. They don't yeah. seem to mm -hmm. know exactly what's happening. Yeah. And they're mm -hmm. just driven out of loyalty and, and love. Yeah. Do you probably feel that because they don't know the seriousness, that's why throughout the way, Mary and Pippin kind of complain here and there and kind of, uh, you know. Yes. Bit, yeah, because they don't have the whole picture. Yeah, they don't have the whole picture. Yes. Absolutely. Well, yeah, speaking of the ring race that you just mentioned. So they go out, so they leave the Shire, and um, they are they begin to understand that there are these hooded dark figures on dark horses riding after them named the Ringwraiths. Who are the Ringwraiths, actually? Well, we know that um, at the beginning, uh, when we start, they start talking about introducing the, the ring and who that ring belonged to, which is to the Lord Sauron, right. um, he created this nine rings, right? Uh, was part of his plot to control the peoples of Mid-Earth. Mid so he gave the nine rings to the kings of men. So we don't know who these kings are, although we do know at least the name of one of them and the witch king. Yes. Uh, but they were kings of men that got corrupted. And because they were the, the rings, they can die. So they're pretty much cursed. Yes. Um, so they're corrupted by, by, the, by power. Um, they, uh, Sauron gives them the, the rings of men, uh, which is nine rings. And they get corrupted by it. Um, those mm -hmm. rings are servants to the One Ring, which is why the the, the one the One Ring is it's called the Ruling Ring. Uh, it's the one that commands the other rings. And and these kings, we don't know exactly who they are. We don't know what kingdoms they belong to. Uh, we know of Kamul, which is one of the Ring Rates' names. The only one that we actually know by name. The Witch King of Agmar is just his title. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout the entire story, we don't really get to know who these who these uh, kings yes. were exactly all we know is that they were corrupted by the rings of power and they were turned into rates eternal life in middle earth is not the same as we believe now like uh, through religious um, you know our religious beliefs uh, eternal life for these people is basically your life it's stretched thin mm -hmm. to the point that you become invisible um, the ring has the ring has power to turn them invisible and it turns them altogether invisible so in order for them to be seen and to be servants of the of of sauron they need to be wearing clothes on top of them mm -hmm. so That's they can right. be seen by by the people and you see the ring rates and the ring rates are one of my favorite um characters in the book they're so mysterious they're so creepy mm -hmm. um very creepy <laughs> but they only gain strength as people fear them they don't really have much power when they go to they, they're talking to gaffer that's the very first time that we see a ring break speaking um they're talking to 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 the gaffer right and he's uh, sam's dad mm -hmm. and they're wondering where mr baggins is or where he where he has gone when he's coming back which way he went and the gaffer kind of sends him back and says no i'm not going to tell you anything i don't know you you know you shouldn't be wondering about other people's business um but they don't, they don't seem very threatening, just kind of eerie, kind of scary, yes. but not threatening, not to the point where you see in the movies where, you know, they're galloping and then you they see them draw their swords and then they slice this, this man. I don't know if right. that's, that's intended to be something that happened or if it's just Frodo imagining it. Um, the point is that they're not that threatening. Uh, when they meet Maggot, a uh, farmer Maggot, um, they offer him gold and you can sense from the way he speaks from the way the ring wraith is speaking at that moment that 
in uh, the Western, which is the language that everybody uses, it's not his first language. You can sense the cut of the sentences. Um, the grammar is not there. The, the fluidity of someone who speaks that language is not there. So you get that sense and that, that um, yeah, that idea that the ring rate himself doesn't speak Western very well. Mm -hmm. uh, he may only know those phrases and right. or have a basic understanding of Western. Um, so that just adds more to the depth of, of, of Tolkien's story. I yeah. mean, you're seeing this creature who's an invented creature and he still has a hard time speaking the language. Um, and it's just fascinating to me when you pick up those little details um, on the story because it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And there's definitely some strange things going on in the forest, that, which brings us to our next portion of the, the book, which is Tom Bombadil. <laughs> and I didn't know this, but I guess Tom Bombadil is a really polarizing character in uh, Tolkien lore. There is a pro uh, Tom Bombadil or anti Tom Bombadil. But when the hobbits are captured by Old Man Willow, um, he, he kind of captures them. Who comes to the rescue is Tom, Tom Bombadil. So, how, what do you guys think? Are you pro Tom Bombadil, anti Tom Bombadil? Because I kind of find him fascinating. I don't know. I just find that him being older than the Earth, being older than Sauron, and all of that was kind of fascinating. And plus, that he was able to play with the ring with no any effect mm -hmm. coming over him. I thought that was pretty fascinating. Fascinating as well. But what what is your take? Are you guys pro or anti Tom Bombadil? I think I'm neutral. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why he's there, right? Right. Uh, so I cannot be like, oh, I don't like him because obviously there's, uh, he's a Meyer. He's a powerful Meyer. Um, there are so many things that I wish I would know a little more in depth about this character. Uh, probably the only thing that that I'm not really liking about him is like him singing all the time right. and, and the way he dresses. <laughs> but other than that, I think his purpose there I think that's what I like. I would like to know more about him. Yeah, I do too, for sure. Yeah, definitely uh, Tom Bombadil is a character that is that is um he's a little out there. Um <laughs> a little <laughs> just a little out there. And the same I agree with Claudia. I mean it's a very neutral situation for me as well. Um I I'm not a huge fan of how he speaks. Some people love it because there's a lot of poetry in, in his words, the mm -hmm. way he speaks, the way he, he um utters that poetry all the time and mm -hmm. for someone who likes poetry in my that might be fascinating but i don't right. to, i'm not a fan i'm not a guy yeah, who's fond of, of poetry so we'll turn you guys don't worry <laughs> i find that like, i have to crawl through those lines uh, so i can yes. pass them through yeah um and even when you listen to the audiobook and you listen to that singing over and over again and then uh, next thing i know i'm speaking in rhymes and i'm also singing you're professing your love in the same way <laughs> for claudia for yes. claudia yeah, yeah the, but tom bombadil is a he is a powerful being yes. um, like claudia said he is a mayar uh, mayar is a very powerful spirit yes. that lived before the world was created. created so gandalf would you would say is yes. a mayar so same gandalf is, is a mayar sauron so. is a mayar um, you have the Balrogs who are also Myers, and you know they're super powerful spirits who are like embodied on this on this um, on this planet, mm -hmm. and they have their own purpose. Every single one of them has their own pur purpose. Um, Tom Bombadil is a master of where he lives. Um, he's not the owner. He is just the master. He's a caretaker, so he takes care of everything that happens around the geographical area that he's been that he has chosen. I'm not sure if he has chosen it or if he's if yes. it was given to him. The point is that he has borders. Um, we know he has borders because when the hobbits are leaving, he tells them, "Okay, well, this is as far as I go. Can't go any further than this." Yeah. Um, but he is a powerful being. I mean, when he speaks and he commands something, things obey him automatically. Uh, when Frodo goes up to him to ask him for help when the old man Will is attacking his friends, uh, Tom Bombadil immediately says, "Whoa, stop right there!" And then, <laughs> and then the book says that Frodo stops, ah. and automatically stops, and he commands old man Will to release the hobbits. He commands the the Barrow rights to to uh, to be gone, to go mm -hmm. away, and they do. I mean, they obey him right away. So he is the master. He's an interesting character. Very Again, we would like to know a little bit more, more about him. Yeah. Like a backstory. A backstory. Yes. 
yes. in Middle Earth a backstory of him. So then Tolkien never really created a backstory for him. He just sort of shows, shows up in the Fellowship, in the Fellowship of the Ring. Of Ring. And any, anywhere else he doesn't really show I up. I haven't read anything yet. Oh, okay. That might show, well, bring him out again. And then you have Goldberry there. Yes, Goldberry. His love for yes. Goldberry. You have? I would love to know a little about her. Why, her, yeah. why he loves her so much. Yeah. Yeah, Goldberry's also awesome, mysterious character. Um, we have the the adventures of Tom Bombadil. Oh. So the adventures of Tom Bombadil is a short story book where it has a lot of poems, oh, okay. and um, it has Tom Bombadil going on little like little side quests and little adventures. Um, but it's a very short story, so you might want to read it. Okay. Also. Written by Tolkien too. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, interesting. Very very interesting. Yeah. So at this point, we kind of move on past the forest and into the sort of melting pot that is the town of Bree, and it's very very interesting in the story. Um, the hobbits come to this door and they're let in and uh, they go to the Prancing Pony, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yep. Where uh, they kind of just sit down, have a drink and kind of, they're all together and uh, somehow Frodo, I mean, I'm sure you guys know exactly how, but Frodo, the ring slips on his finger and he disappears and this draws the attention of a mysterious figure in the corner named Strider. Okay, so the... Strider's a very interesting character who we later learn is Aragorn. Um, and then later on, Aragorn comes to him, to Frodo and the Hobbits, but they don't really kind of give each other away, right? And why is that? Why don't they give each other away saying, I know Gandalf and, you know, I know the request, I know what's going on, I can help you. So that doesn't really happen right away. So why do you think that that is? Well, um, we have to know that, that Strider or Aragorn, he's... He's a very wise man, yeah. Uh, and it's gonna be it's gonna be really easy just to say, oh, I know Gandalf, and stop your quest. You know, just come with me. But um, his goal is for the hobbits to try to learn to trust him as being him, without any help, like outside help, like mm -hmm. oh, Gandalf's friend, so I, we should trust him. But because that could be deceitful, right? Uh, on the long, wrong long, uh, long run. So Strider, he's trying to earn their trust first have them have faith in him first mm -hmm. then by doing so once they actually get to know that he is friends with Gandalf it's gonna be even easier to amplify that you know that trust in him and right. let him take over on this quest excellent and with um, uh, Aragorn comes this sort of sense of uh, nostalgia or a reverence for the ancient world or the ancient past, the ancient mm -hmm. wisdom that once was. And uh, we have the poem of Aragorn, which is not all that glitters is gold. And it sort of talks about how the, the sword will be restored that was once broken and that he will be returned or he that he will return as king. And um, Tolkien has a lot of intertextuality, meaning that there are a lot of influences, uh, outside influences, outside stories and songs that are influencing uh, the current story that is happening now. And um, we get, you know, Aragorn is the one that tells the hobbits the story of Baron and Luthien. And there's a lot of songs and a lot of stories that are told, not just mm -hmm. by Aragorn, but then later Legolas and Gimli when, once we get there. Um, and that sort of notion that um, the sort of longing and reverence for the past kind of gives the hobbits and Aragorn um, allows them to sort of see how history repeats itself and how they could shape their own futures. It kind of gives them hope. While there is some sort of notion that maybe not everything will be perfect, there is still some hope. And um, how do you guys see Aragorn? Where does this melancholy come from? I think um, Aragorn is such a cautious, such a wise character. Um, he holds, he knows who he is, right? He has a sense of who he is uh, in reality. And he understands where he's coming from, and right. I think that's something that that has to do with the reverence for his ancestral, uh, for his ancestors. Um, when he meets the when he meets um, the hobbits for for the very first time, it's not inside the prancing pony. He actually hears them talking about, <laughs> you know, the topics uh, that they're not supposed to be talking out loud. Like, uh, you know, you're not supposed to be discussing the ring out in the open. He hears the talk about uh, Mr. Baggins. And, and because he's already in cahoots with Gandalf, he knows exactly what he's looking for. So he hears the hobbits talking about little subjects outside uh, Bree 
and he follows them and that's when he meets them inside uh, the prancing pony um so he's very cautious he's also he wants to trust the hobbits he wants to um he wants to help them in the in the quest but he wants to make sure that they are the right people that he, he he's actually looking for right. and that has to do with and on how he was raised he was raised in the rivendell um he is of the Duna Dayan, which is the 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 race that's gonna that holds the kingdom of Gondor, basically. The mm -hmm. the heir of Gondor is there. He is the heir of Gondor. Right. He's gonna he's gonna be the king, um, King Elisar eventually. Um, so he has to have the sense of where he's coming from at yes. all times. But at the same time, he's a he's he's a vagabond. I mean, uh, the Rangers aren't looked at. And Bree as these mysterious uh, characters, they look like vagabonds, like homeless people are just kind of wandering around, dangerous even. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but experienced. Very experienced. Yeah, so yes. they know what they're talking about, but they're kind of off, you know, don't talk to them too much, they're a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, until later on when, when the hobbits come back to the Shire and they speak with a Butterbur and they say, oh, you know Strider? Yes, well, he's the king of Gondor now. So. <laughs> like, what? He's like, no way. Yes. But they do. They do have this reverence for the, yes. um, for the, for his ancestors, and mm -hmm. every single race in Middle Earth has this yes. reverence for what was in the past. And and I think, mm -hmm. um, from the Rings of Power, for example, there's this quote that I like from um, Arendir, who says, "The past is with us all, whether we like it or not." And and I think that's true for every single race in in, in Middle Earth. There's things are from the past that kind of follow them throughout the entire um, storylines. Galadriel is in Lothlorien because of her past. Um, she's in Middle Earth because of her past. The Hobbits are in that um, area specifically right. because of their past. So everything that moves around in Middle Earth has to do because of what somebody decided before. Um, and that's Absolutely. how that's how history is for us the same. I mean, we Absolutely. are in our situation currently because of decisions so that were made the... before. Mm -hmm. So don't forget the past. Absolutely. Just try not to repeat it. No, yeah, I totally agree. And that sort of reminds me, too, of the Silmar Silmarillion towards the end, right, when Gandalf, who goes by the other name at that time, but is given the ring Narya, right, and he is told that perhaps that thou shalt rekindle the hearts to the valor of old in a world that grows chill. And so that yes. line was very, very special to me when reading the Silmarillion. But as you said, you know, that sort of, you know, um, look to the past, look to your ancestors and... Um, you know, learn from them, learn and grow and take that sort of valor and honor with you and continue it on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we move on. We know that uh, Frodo is stabbed by one of the ring wraiths in the book. It actually takes a while. Mm -hmm. And he just totally stabbed him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it takes a while for, him, for it to take effect on Frodo. So that's why he's able to ride into Rivendell by himself. You know, in the film, it shows that Arwen is the one who takes him over. But it's in the book, it is he that goes over um, with the help of Elrond. Um, but once Frodo is hurt, he does arrive to Elrond. I'm sorry, he does arrive to Rivendell, and um, he awakes on uh, the 24th of October, which is a special day for me because that's one of my daughter's birthdays. Yeah. You see, it's her birthday, uh, 24th of uh, October. But he awakens, and he's, he sees Gandalf, he sees, uh, he sees Bilbo, and he sees uh, Sam and Merry and Pippin. Um, but he also meets some new people, um, and once they finally move into the Council of Elrond, there is uh, dwarves there, there yes. are um, elves there, there are um, other humans. We meet Boromir for the first time there. And uh, what is really going on in the Council of Elrond? Because they each all come together from wherever they are coming from, and they tell their own stories, and then uh, they decide what to do. To have a what council, is happening? Right? Well, um, we have to to understand what type of place is, is Rivendell. Right. And, and there, it's a place that many people gather, like they visit. Mm -hmm. So it's not like uh, just a little, or not a little place, but a big place or like a kingdom that only you will find only one race, like only elves. But people travel there many times right. and you will find any type of uh, race in there. So that's how Lord Elrond is. He mm -hmm. welcomes everyone. Mm -hmm. to his home, I guess. Yeah, yeah, think of it as a resort. Yes, it's a resort. Know, that's, so that's perfect. It's beautiful. It's right on the edge of what's considered the wild world and the civilized world. So it's the last homely house um, that you can find in that particular area, right? And, and like Claudia said, it's not a kingdom. Elrond is no king. 
he's just he just happens to live there. He kind of overseas, overseas that everything goes well within within Rivendell. Um, mm -hmm. And the home is open for everybody. Everybody who wants to go in. So when you see when you when we get to the Council of Elrond, a lot of interesting things are happening. You have all these people who are just happen to be there right. um, by chance. Mm -hmm. um, different races. You have the people from Erebor who have come. You have people from uh, Gondor who are there. You have people from Mirkwood um, who just happen all to be there. It's like one of those busy days before, uh, right before a holiday. And everybody just kind of shows up um, and Elrond is like, well, since everybody's here, we may as well have a council because there's this really dangerous thing that just came in here. Yeah, everyone should know about it. But you see, see. you see how, how um, nothing in Tolkien's world, it just happening by chance. Um, everything is being placed right. strategically by someone who's moving the pieces. Again, it's not explicitly told that it's Eru during the movie. But we can assume, we can safely assume that it's it's Edo doing all the moving, uh, moving all the pieces into place. Inspiring them. You need mm. to go to this place. Excellent. Um, and once again, we have the call of responsibility. Um, even though these are uh, different creatures from different races coming together, we feel that there's a bit of tension between some of the members yes. there. We see Boromir totally blown away by hobbits. It's really, really mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, but they all accept this call to responsibility, and even though they weren't really commanded by Elrond to do it, um, he kind of gathered them together, right? And even though they had the choice to leave, they never chose to leave. They chose to go forth with this plan and helping Frodo get rid of this ring. So he, he, he gathers Gimli, he gathers Legolas, the hobbits, four of them, Gandalf, will go Aragorn, Boromir. Um, that is nine altogether. Mm -hmm. He doesn't send Glorfindel, who we later learn is a super powerful elf. But yes. why do you guys think that Elrond is like, no, we'll keep him here? <laughs> so Glorfindel is it's an extraordinary character, right? He fought uh, at the fall of Gondolin. He fought a Balrog himself. And he died in the process. And throughout Tolkien's um, story on how elves come back to life, which is a little murky, um, especially if you read The Nature of Middle-earth, which is in one of the newer books that came about. Uh, the whole resurrection thing on elves, it's kind of it's kind of a gray area of, of weirdness, right? But we should assume that it's Glorfindel who has come back to life. Hmm. Again, he's very powerful. He's a, a, yes. a super powerful wild card of hero. of hero that they have. He's a strong man. The situation with it is, first of all, the ring is a, a problem of the races who are currently living in the world, um, specifically men. Um, the elves are departing, the elves are about to leave. That's um, right. And it's basically a problem for men. And Is we know we know that by chance, by chance, Frodo has been selected to be the bearer of the ring. So he's the one, he's the one who has to complete the task. Everyone else is a volunteer to him to help him out. Um, Sauron knows, or Sauron is aware of where the, the 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 resistance can be established, right? So you have Rohan, you have Gondor, you have Lothlorien, and then you have um, Rivendell. Those are the strongholds that Sauron fears the most. Um, there's an attack on Rivendell later on, but we don't we don't um, we don't see it. At least not it's not a story that that is told to us. Right. Um, the the task needs to be accomplished in secrecy. Uh, and it's something that it's hard for a lot of us to understand, especially if you're new into the Lord of the Rings. You you tend to go into <laughs> into you know the obvious. Oh well, you know why don't the eagles yeah, fly cool. them into Mount Doom and then uh, just drop the ring into the another good point, <laughs> right? Uh, why not send Glorfindel? He seems strong enough to deal with Sauron himself. And yes, I mean we could have gone that. We would have had a shorter uh, story. Um, <laughs> But it's not about that. It's about it's about having that secrecy of going through in without the knowledge of the Dark Lord. If the Dark Lord finds out that Glorfindel, Glorfindel is on the way, or if the eagles, you know, there's ten eagles that are coming his way, he has enough air force to destroy the eagles. He has enough manpower or power to come and, and encounter Glorfindel and whatever armies. Um, so it's going to be more difficult for Glorfindel to accomplish his task. So the most logical thing to do is send some someone in secrecy. 
uh, completely without blinded mm-hmm. to the yes. eye to the eye that that sees everything, right? Yes. Right, and, the, and remember, it does mention at the beginning of the uh, the book that uh, the hobbits did have that special talent of being able to hide really quickly and yes. away from danger, to pass unnoticed, unnoticed, right? Yes. yes. So that's why. So it was perfect, you know, to send out a hobbit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, and I do want to mention that once again we see that theme of uh, good versus evil here. Um, they all gather together because they want to do good. They want to, um, you know, protect what is good, their home, and to fight against this evil that is, you know, very real. And um, what uh, Tolkien, and like you said, he was known as a philologist, and his ideas of good and evil can be seen and represented in the language that he uses. You remember you were saying mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. he was uh, in love with language and that he really liked beautiful language. And so um, we can compare places such as Rivendell and Lothlorien and characters such as Galadriel or um, Glorfindel. Sounds really nice. Sounds very pretty, rolling off the tongue. And then when you, he contrasts that with uh, places like Moria, Mordor, uh, the Nazgul, the Orc, Isengard, and places such as a, a sort of more guttural sounds. It's kind mm-hmm. of like when you try to say those words, it sounds like the words are kind of just dumping out of your mouth, like heavy baked potatoes or something. But mm-hmm. with these types of language, the Elvish language is very, very lyrical and very beautiful Mm -hmm. and so yeah it's just going back to uh, to the different types of um, locations the different types of races as well Um, but yeah I I just found that one uh, that one theme popping out once again at me uh, during this time uh, at Rivendell so once they leave Rivendell they come up to the mountains of Caradras and uh, later they decide that the mountains are too treacherous and the company instead goes through Moria uh, much to the chagrin of Gandalf and Aragorn, um, uh, Glowin, uh, not Glowin, but Gimli is all about it, I don't know, <laughs> and, but the rest, not so much, um, and unfortunately, we all know that Gandalf is lost during that, that passage um, through Moria, but going back to the mountains, um, I always thought it was really weird that you can, um, I think it was Legolas that said that he can hear fell voices in the, in the air, in the air around uh, these mountains, and so what... Is the, what is going on with the mountain? Is this a mountain of Sauron, or is this sort of a mountain that is its own mountain? Is the mountain yeah. evil? What is the mountain doing to right, the The mountain evil? defeats them? Yes. Yes. Right. They told, it totally defeats them. Yeah. So, um, Karadras is very, it's a very um, interesting subject, because when you're reading it in the book, it's not very clear whether there's something behind controlling um, the weather pattern, because they're actually facing the weather. Yeah. Um, yes. One of the things that uh, we were listening to um, a podcast by Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor. If you guys um, don't know about him, you should check him out. He, he's really knowledgeable and everything about Tolkien. I listen to him a lot. We'll probably link it in the description. Um, yeah, we could probably do that. Yeah. Um, he explains a little bit about the mountain itself. And he says that the mountain, everything in Tolkien's world, um, there's certain things in Tolkien world that are alive and that's one of the things that everything is alive in the world mountains are alive rocks are alive trees are alive Beautiful. and they all have their own spirit yeah. and because they have their own spirit they have their sentient they, they know for themselves and they're not necessarily in one side or the other so it's not a, a good versus evil type of situation Interesting. there's such a mix of everything in the world that it comes to a point that you're going to encounter things that are not going to be fond of you and you've never done anything to them. Why is um, Old Man Willow you know, trying, to eat, trying to eat the hobbits for true. no apparent reason? That, that's um, true. The Old Forest is angry at the, at the hobbits mm-hmm. and they can sense, they can feel the oppression when they start crossing from Buckland into the Old Forest. Mm-hmm. And that's because the hobbits did a burning of trees before. So the forest knows and then they are angry towards the hobbits. Oh, um, so of trees. So <laughs> Caradras, Caradras is interesting because you have the dwarves who are living right under it. And it's sad that the dwarves delve too deeply and too, um, too greedily and too deep. So I'm wondering mm, if that's, that's where true. where the hatred comes from. Maybe because the mountain knew that a, a dwarf was among them. Oh. Yeah, or maybe it didn't like the elves or it didn't like the dwarves. Um, yes, because Gimli is saying throughout this whole time, you know, 
Karadras is mad, right? He's mm-hmm. mad at us. Other people don't really understand what he's saying, but he's saying this mountain is angry. This mountain is attacking us. So yeah. you're absolutely and then, right. And and Boromir is the only one who seems to be like, no, we we have to push through. We have to push through. You know, bringing that side of men, of trying to dominate things. Yeah. And sometimes you won't be able to. Right. And they get defeated by the mountain. Right. Yeah. Which leads us, of course, you know, we see the theme of friendship. So, um, and the leadership of Gandalf and of Aragorn. We see Aragorn, you know, which is really interesting to me. You know, he 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 follows to Cahadras, or he, um, he's more willing to go through Cahadras than uh, Moria, the mines right. of Moria. Yeah. And but Gandalf says we have to go this way, and he follows Gandalf mm-hmm. in this situation, which was always interesting to me. That's where, uh, you know, unfortunately we, we lose Gandalf, you know, when he fights the Barag on the bridge of Khazad Doom. Um, but at that particular moment as well, we see uh, the thing come out of a protection or a love of one's own home or, you know, place of one's protecting uh, um, the protecting what you love and protecting your home. So when Gandalf is fighting the Barag, Boromir, he grows... Um, grows in courage and he shouts for Gondor and then Aragorn, Aragorn sh- shouts for Elendil, is that the name of the place? Mm-hmm. And um, they're both trying to help Gandalf in the situation. And w- earlier we see, and I forgot to mention this earlier, that Frodo does the same in the, the forest when he saves his fellow hobbits, he's, he shouts for the Shire. Mm-hmm. And so this theme of protecting one's own home, protecting what one loves, um, is very evident here in this chapter. And I just wanted to get your guys' opinion about that when, you know, they're facing the Balrog, which is a, you know, a scary demon. They grow in courage, though. What do you feel about the whole scene with Gandalf as he's lost? Oh, and he also mentions that he is, um, he is, he serves the light. and wielder of the flame of honor. Thank you. Now, what does that mean? (laughs) Where's the flame of honor? Here it is. Let's show it to, to yeah. everybody. Okay, so um, the the Balrog is a mire, right? A very mm. powerful spirit, uh, who has embodied spirit. Uh, basically fire and shadow. Mm. Um, they're very powerful. They use a whip, right? What well, that's one of the interesting things about the confrontation is they use a whip. Uh, whips in Tolkien's world represent slavery, so mm. the the Balrog is trying to dominate um, the the fellowship. Now, before that begins, uh, Boromir, I don't know if you can see it back here, but I have the horn. The horn. The horn of Boromir. Mm -hmm. Boromir blows his horn, and the Balrog stops, which kind of suggests the fact that the horn itself is magical. Magical enough to stop the Balrog for a brief second, and enough to to, um, Gandalf to show up and, and to offer his protection. Now, Gandalf is wearing Narya. I don't know if you can see it there. <laughs> uh, Narya is the ring of f- uh, fire, and it was given to him by by Kirtan, uh in the Silmarillion. We we you know uh, Gandalf gets the ring. I think you can also find it in the appendixes uh, when he gets his his ring as well. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. That ring enables him or gives him enough power to control the light, to control uh, the blessed light, and he's encountering the dark light. So it's like a a darkness versus, versus light. light kind of encounter between them two. Mm-hmm. Um, Gandalf is able to stop the Balrog and and defeat him ultimately, but then he takes you know it, it takes his life also with him mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, but yes, Gandalf is wielding when he says, "I am the wielder of a flame on Larnor." He's talking about his ring Narya, um, which is the fire ring, um, the ring of power. Yeah, what a beautiful scene! Even though it was. So heartbreaking in the book when we come across it. Um, you always hope that it would be different this time and that he would sur- survive. survive. But um, you know he's lost at least in this in this part of the book and this, this part of the Lord of the Rings story. Um, and then once again, um, after they defeat or not defeat, but they move on past the mines of Moria, we see again a reverence of the ancient world and of wisdom. We see Gimli's touching moment at the monument of Durin, which is. Khaled Saram, am I pronouncing that correctly? Khaled Saram or Miromir? Mm-hmm. But it's just a touching moment. I wanted to get you guys' opinion about um, Gimli, who I feel is one of my favorite characters because he's just a rough and ready guy who's not very sensitive. He's a dwarf, so they have a 
a kind of a shady shady past like like all of the races do but um in this situation there is a touching moment where he kind of bowed out bows down to this monument and he's once again reverencing the past what do you guys feel about good old gimli <laughs> the reverence that he has for doing and that's not just gimli it's all the dwarves the dwarves, the dwarves yes. Uh, the descendants of Durin, uh, they believe that Durin comes back to life um, every so many generations. Kelitsarm. Okay. It's this uh, beautiful monument, and then Gimli is so excited to show Frodo uh, the place. So he's like, yes, well, we have to I go. I love that. We have to go. You have to see awesome. this. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I believe that's where Durin uh, sees his reflection. And, um, yes. There's, some, uh, there's something mystical about it uh, for the dwarves. Yeah. And the dwarves have this great reverence and Gimli um, has traveled so long um, and he must see it. It's like you have to go, you have to see this place. So beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful place and it shows again that reverence, that, that deep love that they have for their own people and for their, um, for their traditions, uh, for their, their own mythology. Um, and and it's, it's fascinating. I mean, yeah, it's, I it's, it's, an incredible, it's an incredible scene. Um, that when you read it, it's it's just a very touching moment. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the parts in the novel for me when I was just like, oh, I have a soft spot for Gimli mm-hmm. now. You know, he's so he's so sweet. He's got that sensitive side to him. So then they go on and mm-hmm. they start heading towards Lothlorien, which is another uh, elf dwelling, correct? And um, and while they're there, their bonds become strengthened, and we see such. Um, and their determination strengthened as well. So we have the friendship uh, aspect come out again when the company all agrees to uh, go through blindfolded. Mm-hmm. And um, first, because the elves see that Gimli is a dwarf, they do not want him to see what's going on. The dwarves, yes. Yeah, he do, they do not want to see that p- place of dwelling. But, you know, uh, under the direction of or the leadership of Aragorn, he s- suggests that they all go blindfolded. And mm-hmm. I love that scene so much just because... They all are willing to do it, even Legolas. <laughs> and begrudgingly, they, but begrudgingly, but they do it like, anyway. Come on. And uh, no. yeah, absolutely, this unifies mm-hmm. them even more that they are a team, that they are there for each other. Mm-hmm. And um, I just wanted to get you guys' opinion about that as well. They, them going through them blind- going through the blindfolded. Yes, so teamwork. <laughs> teamwork. Um, <laughs> right. So there's this stain. There's a there's a disdain between elves and dwarves, right? And that be, that goes back to um, ages, ages yes. before. I mean, there's this uh, the the uh, the elves and and the uh, what is that chain? The 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 necklace the, the called necklace. the Nauglamir. Mm-hmm. It goes back to that point. I mean. Oh, yeah. During the first stage, it was the sun wasn't even up when these these people were already fighting. Um, so that disdain goes along, and again, they don't forget the past. Elves live uh, basically forever before our eyes, right? Well, we know elves do age mm-hmm. uh, with time. They do age. We just don't perceive it because we're human and we're mortal, and we just see them exactly the same way. But mm-hmm. eventually, their bodies diminish and their bodies fade. Um, but they do remember those fights, and there's there this enmity still exists between dwarves and elves, mm-hmm. and the the elves are very are very um, protective of, yes. of their yes. of their realms, mm-hmm. and they don't want any dwarves to be going in and knowing how to get there because they you know fear that they may be betrayed later on. And you have this moment where Aragorn basically says, "No, we're all gonna go blindfolded." And then yes. even Legolas says, "Fine, but you know, I don't know why I have to do it. I'm an elf, also." <laughs> yeah. But sure, you know, whatever. Yes. Um, and and it happens because you said so. I'll do it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. They're all doing it together as a team, mm-hmm. working as a team. And then once again, we see the call of responsibility. Um, just a reminder to Sam because um, when Galadriel and they meet Galadriel and one night she shows Frodo and Sam the mirror. Sam sees the Shire and he wants to go home. He has, he's homesick. He wants to go home. He wants to go back to that place of safety, of peace, of just, you know, comfort. Um, but he resolves to continue on. And um, he, she also shows uh, Frodo this in this point of time of, uh, he, he, I'm sorry, she allows him to look into the, to the mirror and um, she says to him that these are things that can happen or cannot happen. It all depends, right? And why why do you feel that that she shows him all this, w- even though that you know what 
it won't show really what what is in the future or in the past or you know i think she she does that uh so that he can solidify his resolution on continuing right um i mean if we were given the chance to see into the future you know the results of our choices we might be more prompt to pick the correct choice or like make a better decision just by knowing what the result is sometimes we don't know so we sometimes mm -hmm. we go blind and we're hoping for the best right um now you have a hobbit here that is missing home right now right. you know just like sam would like not to be part of it just want to go back but just by showing he what could happen to his home if mm -hmm. he chooses to go back and not continue that kind of like puts a little more responsibility into him be like nobody else is gonna do it if you don't right. do it everything is lost mm -hmm. so that kind of like solidifies his his resolution to go and be like okay this is my task and i have to see it through because i know what could happen if i don't right and he loves his home he yeah. loves his safety place and mm -hmm. he's like i want to protect him yeah. so i think that's one of the reasons why uh galadriel chooses both of them you know yeah. you need to see this you know to see the reason why you are yes. here because sometimes like even even they probably didn't really understand or had their big grasp of their importance right as hobbits, because they're like tiny yeah and they'll be like what can i do i'm just a hobbit yeah but just by showing them this could happen you can only do it even you know you might think you you're just this little hobbit, this little creature, but you have a big responsibility placed upon you. Right. So Absolutely. just by seeing them, they're like, okay, then I, I gotta, I gotta do it. Yeah. Right. You have to know what's at stake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the cards that you were given and you're going to have to deal with them. Otherwise, this is going, that can happen. Okay. If, if you don't take responsibility and if you don't, if you don't take this thing seriously, then this can potentially happen. Yeah. And you see Frodo changing from that point. Before mm -hmm. he was scared, he was um, hesitant, he was um, confused even. Once um, once he sees that, you see him more determined. Mm -hmm. And he's willing to later on... Uh, Make choices, uh, uh, difficult choices. Yes. Uh, par uh, when, when they arrived to Park Valen, that he's willing to part away from them and say okay well i need to go if you don't want to follow me that's fine but i have to do this yeah um so he that is solidifying in him that responsibility yeah so yeah that needed to happen absolutely and um, and we also see galadriel again um she is tempted once again uh, just like elrond before her and gandalf before him but she is tempted with the ring but she refuses and so she also once again realizes that no once i have that you know it can corrupt me and it can corrupt a lot of you know future things that can be happening so we move on past that and i just wanted to also mention when they are leaving lothlorien it was one of my favorite parts as well because it involves gimli showing a softer mm. side she imparts uh, galadriel imparts gifts to the company and um she asks uh, Gimli what he would want and he wants um, some hair from Galadriel and um, it was just a sweet moment in how in love he was with Lothlorien and with Galadriel and um, he has a sad moment he feels the melancholy he feels the sadness come over him because he he has, doesn't want to leave he doesn't want to leave it's once again such yes. a place of beauty such a such a place of um, just awe and he he has to leave and Legolas, who, you know, up until that point, I mean, not, I mean, there are hints of friendship there, but they were, you know, squabbling a little bit along the way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they've become closer and closer. And um, Legolas says to him, and I will share this with you all. But I count you blessed, Gimli, son of Glowin, for your loss, you, for your loss you suffer of your own free will. And you might have chosen otherwise, but you have not forsaken your companions. And the least reward that you shall have is that the memory of Lothlorien shall remain ever clear and unstained in your heart, and shall never fade nor grow stale. And then Gimli says, maybe, and I thank you for your words, true words doubtless, 
yet all such comfort is cold. Memory is not what the heart desires. So he is, mm -hmm. he he knows that perhaps he may not see that place again. But I just think it was a touching moment between him and Legolas because Legolas is trying to comfort him and saying, you know, this will always be in your heart and in your memories. He's like, um, I don't want my memories. Yeah, I, I want, want to live here. here. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's just a touching moment. But anyway, Anduin. So they move on to the river Anduin. And um, this fall, and at, what comes after this is the splitting up of the company, unfortunately. But uh, they realize that Gollum is following them. And um, this kind of adds a little bit of uh, anxiety to Frodo and to Sam. And um, But also at the same time, things are also starting to fall apart within the company because they realize that there is one among them who really wants the ring. And we find out, unfortunately, it is Boromir, and, um, by, who by all accounts is a great person, a great man, an honorable man. But he is tempted once again by the power of the ring. And so um, we don't get to see the redemption, unfortunately, of Boromir and the Fellowship of the Rings um, at the end of the novel. It's just Frodo and Sam who escape. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really know what happens to Boromir. But I wanted to get you guys' opinion, too, about Boromir. What was his purpose at the beginning of the book? Or how do you see his character trajectory from the beginning towards, towards this end of the book? Um, when it comes to Boromir... Boromir is um, such a misunderstood character a lot of the times, um, especially yeah. because a lot of the people who are familiarized with Boromir are familiarized through the what you see in the movies. Yes, um, very different. And you shouldn't compare them. Um, they're very different characters. Um, yes, Sean Bean does really well with Boromir. I mean, we, I can't, oh, yeah. I cannot see Sean Bean Not as Boromir. anyone else as Boromir yeah. in my head whenever I'm reading uh, The Lord of the Rings. Um, Boromir represents men. Um, Aragorn's not fully, a, I mean, he is a man, but he's a different kind of man. He's a Numenorean. He's descended from Numenor, so he has a different kind of blood in him that allows him to live longer. Mm -hmm. um, Boromir is not. Boromir is a more diluted uh, version of a Numenorean, very diluted. Mm -hmm. um, so he is basically a normal man. Um, and therefore, he's our representative. Me as a reader, as a, as, a, as a human being, I'm reading, and Boromir is the only character that I can actually relate to because mm -hmm. he is a man. And he's an honorable man. He's doing everything uh, for his people. He's mm -hmm. doing everything Sweet. he's trying to do for his people. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, because he's a man, he's also uh, faced with the temptation of the ring, and he has a choice to make. Mm -hmm. um, and he chooses to help his people he's not doing it so much to gain power but the ring does offer him to be ultimately powerful right mm -hmm. um and you have to keep in mind that he lives in gondor which is a storm a stone's throw from mordor i mean Osgiliath, so you have you have Minas Tirith, and then you have Osgiliath, and you have mordor right next to him so he grew up seeing the horror of Mordor all the time. Yes. So he's probably the only one who can tell the company, no, we need to use this because I know what they're capable of doing. Right. Um, they have been at war for decades. Um, he helped um, um, save Osgiliath at one point. I mean, throughout, throughout his career, his military career, he's been fighting against Mordor over and over and over again against the orcs who live there. Um, so he's pretty much the only one who understands um how he needs to use the ring like he's seen his people suffer i can imagine if you ever if you ever seen scenes from war um i grew up when i was a little kid i grew up in in, in my own country and it was in the middle of a civil war so I, I have a vague recollection of how the horrors of what that can cost mm -hmm. and boromir says we have this one ring we have this thing oh. that can make us powerful that can help us destroy and vanquish the dark lord and we should use it because I have seen the horrors of war. Right. And you guys, you know, Legolas, you've been safer in your, you know, in your little forest sure. up in Mirkwood. Yeah. The hobbits don't even know what war is. <laughs> um, Gimli has been in Erebor all this time under, under, the, under the mountain. I mean, right. like, what do you guys can tell me about, about war? Like, yeah. I know because I've been there. So when you see Boromir through those eyes, through that angle, then you begin to understand and you say, okay. So yeah. out of desperation and love for his people, he chooses the wrong, which is trying to take the ring from Frodo by force. Right. Yeah, he is a misunderstood character. One of the more fascinating characters, I think, in The Fellowship mm -hmm. of the Rings, for sure. Um, some characters 
you at least in the book don't seem very tempted by the ring sort of like Gimli, Legolas um, and Aragorn but why do you think that is? Why do you think that some are affected more or others not? Or is it just because you know they haven't really come in closer contact with the ring? Yeah, so Aragorn, Aragorn uh, to understand those three characters we might want to speak about Aragorn. Um, Aragorn yes. um, he's not very tempted by the ring he's not tempted by the ring because he's not letting himself be tempted by the ring one of the things about aragon is unlike the other characters like eladriel like um, gandalf aragon doesn't make the decision to reject the ring when he's offered the ring he had already made the decision beforehand mm -hmm. so he, he 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 knows and he understands his weakness in the movie you have this quote where he says the same blood runs through my through my veins, the same weakness. Right. So going right. back to the story, you know, the experiences from his ancestors yes. coming back. The so he learned the from them, yes. Yes. Right. So he knows Isildur's bane, which is the ring, and he knows what can cause and what the downfall of Isildur. So he knows and understands this and he says from the very beginning, I am not going to be tempted by the one ring. Okay. It is not gonna make me fall. And I think that's a wise choice. And we sometimes come across our, our own temptations in the world. And instead of making the decision on the spot, then we should follow that example and try to make a decision before it and say, I am not going to do this if it's presented to me at one point. Yes, definitely makes things a lot easier mm -hmm. yes. for him, for sure, in this moment. And it's the same way. I mean, Legolas and Gimli are, yeah. are more loyal to Aragorn. Um, and they want to follow him, so they whatever he says, we're gonna do. Um, nice. So they're not really coming a contact in contact with the ring at all. Because right. um, Gimli, he's just stubborn. Their focus is just yeah. Aragorn, and yes, mm -hmm. dwarves are stubborn by nature. nature. So mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> and then we have you know um, the once again the theme of friendship and the call to responsibility. This time, Frodo and Sam break off away from the company to continue on on their journey towards Mordor. Um, and Frodo decides this because he sees that the ring has affected the company and that the company is fractured because of Boromir. And uh, yeah, they just go on. And that's where the story sort of ends. So thank you guys all for bearing with me with the summary and the themes that pop up. But I just wanted to um, uh, talk about some just some final thoughts, some final questions for you guys. Just personal mm -hmm. questions to um, what is your favorite character of Lord of the Rings? It's it's really hard to pick a, a favorite character. I maybe really, yeah, maybe I should say Fellowship of the Rings since we're only talking yes. about Fellowship of the Rings. Um, each one is like very singular, and they they have like their traits that are make them so unique. Yes. Um, so I want to say to me it will be Gimli. I like Gimli <laughs> he's, too. <laughs> he's funny. I don't he's know. Funny. He's, he's funny, but uh, although he's like stubborn he's very courageous he's like he's ready to just jump oh, in action yeah. all he's the ready. time he's not afraid of anything and uh sometimes he's very humble too yeah uh, in his own way and sweet um, <laughs> yes um i want to see the other the other character i really like is galadriel, galadriel. Uh, if we go towards female uh characters would be galadriel would one my favorite Absolutely. character She's yeah. very, very wise. Very wise. Very experienced, you know, through all her years. You mm -hmm. know, she became the person she's like, especially here in the Fellowship of the Brain. Uh, because of all that experience she carried, like, she at the very beginning, she was very, very stubborn. She wanted power, but, you know, then right. she kind of, like, mellowed out, yes. you know, was more calm, but and wiser. Mm -hmm. uh, she's still my very female character. Yeah. Of the Lord of the Rings. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, and I agree with Claudia. Galadriel has to be my favorite character from the Fellowship of the Ring. Wow. Um, she is such a powerful character. Um, yeah. Lothlorien is is such a blessed kingdom. Yes. It is the only place where the Marlin trees grow. There's no other place in the entire world where mm -hmm. those trees grow, and that's because Galadriel thought of them, and then they just started growing. I wow. mean, that's how powerful she She's is. She's very powerful. Um, she is. Um, an exceptionally wise character now that ages have gone by and at one point I think Tolkien wanted to to show that she was already starting to age and to fade um, with Tolkien in the nature of Middle Earth you learn about two things that um, elves have a spirit and their bodies and their spirit is eternal but then the bodies do diminish with time they start 
going into this back to the future mode where they start getting transparent <laughs> uh, because of so much time has gone by. And at one point, Tolkien wanted to have Galadriel start to show those that the signs of aging already um, by the time the Fellowship shows up. Uh -huh. She's been around forever. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just the scale of how wise and how powerful she is that makes her such a... So, I don't know. It stands out so much for yeah, me. Yeah, it really does. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't pick anybody from the Fellowship because I love oh, yeah. the entire Fellowship. And they're you amazing. Gandalf. Oh, I love <laughs> Gandalf. Gandalf is amazing. It's just, I love and then you too. have Aragorn, this wisest man. Yeah. Just a wise man. Yes. A good and then, example of mas good masculinity in, in yeah. literature. And then, and then you have Sam, the loyal. Sam. Like, yeah. Without Sam... Like, pretty could not have gotten to, yeah, to the end. This is why we love Tolkien. Yes. This is why is the characters absolutely. Yes, right. you can I learn just... a lot from each one. Yes. There's one character though that <laughs> nobody talks about very often, but I think it's funny, and it's funny, and not that it's my favorite character, but it's just a character that kind of stuck with me, uh -huh. and it's the fox. Oh, the fox. There's a fox at the very beginning of the book where he sees Sam, uh, Mary, Pippin, and Frodo sleeping, and then this, the fox stops and looks at them. He's like, oh, hobbits. <laughs> what a peculiar sight. <laughs> and he's like, I've never seen hobbits around, like, I don't know what's going on. And then the, the fox just I leaves. I don't remember that that well. well. And then the fox just You're leaves. An expert. <laughs> and and it's amazing. You don't get animals speaking Speed. in Middle yes, Earth, and this the one of the only ones that speaks in Middle Earth um, that we can that see, at so least funny. in the Fellowship of the Ring. That's that the only animal. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look it up. Then. Yeah, I have to go back. Yeah, it's a little fox. Is at the very beginning. They had just left the Shire. I think they're still in, inside the Shire when yes. it happens. They're just sleeping around. And the fox shows up, and he's like, huh. How it's sleeping. <laughs> That's strange. Well, that that was random. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. It just sort of shows it's just the magic of of Middle Earth, just in mm -hmm. the the different, you know. The, the trees, the animals, the rocks, as you say, have their own spirits and that's um favorite passage. What is one of your guys' favorite passages? <laughs> I think my one of my favorite passages is where uh Gandalf is speaking to to Frodo. You know, I felt like even that encouraging that, yeah. you know, he was meant to have the the ring. Mm -hmm. um, not because it was his destiny, but because there is someone who trusts in him. Mm -hmm. He played, you know, this someone, the supreme someone, which will be Eru, had, you know, this big trust on Frodo yeah. to accomplish that. And that kind of like gives me hope, you know, that, you yeah. know, that he trusts me, you know, to be able to complete, you know, or accomplish many things. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I'm like, we should probably, probably. print it out and put it on our, yeah. you know, on our... Absolutely. And that wall. reminds yes. me of a token, Tolkien's quote of a, applicability that this book is not a parable or anything like that, mm -hmm. but it's a, a book of applicability that mm -hmm. we yes. need to apply these principles and these truths to our lives. And I just totally agree with that. Your favorite passage. Wow. Okay. So I have... Um, I have two. Okay. My favorite passage of all time in the Fellowship of the Ring it is a uh, the hobbits are walking in the forest. This is before they find um, uh, Gildor, the the elf. Um, Gildor in Glorian encounters them, uh, but right before this happens, they have an encounter with the ring wraith. And to me, it is the most scary scene in the entire book. <laughs> so scary. More than them being. Uh, and Sama Naur, I mean, right before destroying the One Ring, nothing, nothing compares to this moment where they're walking around in the dark. Um, oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. And then around yes. the the turn of the road, they see the a ring wraith, a cloaked um, character coming on a horse, and they they stop and they kind of hide and they see him and he's kind of just like sniffing around in the dark and then he comes down from his horse, he gets off the horse. And then he starts crawling towards them oh in on the ground as he's sniffing about. And it's so creepy, so eerie. Yes. And I can imagine. And the entire the entire scene when they're like fleeing from the from the raids and they go into um, uh, Farmer Maggot's um, farm. And then they flee with uh, Mr. Maggot into the, the and they encounter Mary along the way. That whole scene where they're kind of uh, running away from the ring raids um it is 
it is a very interesting and like so captivating scene like you want to know what's what's going on i'm a mm-hmm. guy i i like the mystery so mm-hmm. um any story that has a mystery it keeps me going because mm-hmm. i kind of like to know what's going yes. on once i find out what happened then i lose interest altogether there like, you okay, go. You're not done. yeah yeah you want to figure things out i totally yes. get that then the other scene um is right after the attack on brie Okay. So the ring rays show up at night and they attack Bree because they're trying to find the hobbits. Mm-hmm. And then in the morning when they wake up and they find, you know, the whole place, the shovel completely in disarray, uh, it gives that feeling of an aftermath of some big event. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on like a hurricane or an earthquake or even uh, a like somebody breaking into someone's house like the day after there's this weird yeah. feeling in the air yeah. that something happened something bad happened uh, in yes this place. i know what you're you saying can feel it. Yes. you can feel it and you can feel it in the chapter right once you're leaving and everybody's just like kind what happened confused. last night yeah there's a confusion there's a fear going yes, on but it's fear. daytime mm-hmm. um so it's always interesting what how it makes me feel that's what i like most about the the story the chapters Ah, excellent Mm. that's awesome so i've asked Mm -hmm. you guys what is lord of the rings where is lord of the rings i'll do you one better why is lord of the rings um what can we gather from this It, it goes back to to him having the desire of creating this kind of mythology for his own country for england um, at the time, he felt that there was not enough history, there's not enough richness in the mythology of England. Um, like, you know, like the ancient Romans or like the uh, Greeks. Like the Greeks. Yes. Um, there's a lack of that. There's a lack of background history. It's all like very simple. Mm-hmm. So he started going into this um, as, a, as a way of creating this mythology for, for England. Mm-hmm. And he loved his country very much. Um, he was devoted to England. He wanted... Um, the Anglo-Saxons to, you know, to, to have some kind of uh, richness in, in their mythology and their history. And I think that's where, he, that's where it comes from. Also, the fact that there were no really good stories um, at the time that he felt that they were actually good for children, um, nothing that they could learn from. Yes, you have a lot of stories. And actually, Tolkien used a lot of his inspiration or he inspired himself or he liked, let's say, um, better he liked the stories of george mcdonald um, mm-hmm. i don't know if you ever had a chance to read no, george mcdonald's stories they're beautiful That's stories nice. they're really old and really hard to get books um so you won't find them that easily i mean you could probably find the soft covers but the original ones are very hard to find because they're from the 1800s oh wow um and he took a lot of the the concepts of fairy um, from george mcdonald and from other sources as well but um it was because of that he wanted to create something better um for for the people for his country uh and i think he succeeded i mean oh yeah <laughs> high fantasy is is um what everything is based on nowadays yes. tolkienisms are everywhere you have Absolutely. dungeons and dragons you have even star, star wars, wars. Star wars. Um, everything is it feeds from tolkien the our concept of elves nowadays is based on what tolkien um, rearranged mm-hmm. for elves because elves was something different back then mm-hmm. more, um, like fairies. more like fairies yeah not anymore. No. I mean, whenever you see a show, a TV show or a new book, when it talks about elves, you always will see them as human size, pointy ears, beautiful, eternal, uh, magical. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so what great literature does is challenge you, but also reveals deep truths um, and wisdom hidden in deep layers of just beautiful lyrical writing. Tolkien is no exception. We have friendship. We have love. We have uh, carrying one another's burdens. Um, cherishing the past wisdom, learning from the past, those sort of things, courage, the call of responsibility, all of these different things are truths that we find that are eternal truths that were as true back then as they are are as true now. Things are what gives meaning to our lives and it just makes a much more, it makes for a much more fulfilling life. I totally agree. So we can learn so much from Tolkien. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend this book. Um, I'm so grateful for you guys for coming today. Thank you so much for coming and talking and nerding out with uh, all of us (laughs) on uh, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, Please like, comment, and uh, we are going to be reading um, Alexander Dumas' Count of Monte Cristo. I just started the book. It's about 1,200 plus pages, so get started on it as soon as you can. But yes, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings, two thumbs up.